Hey there. So we're really excited today to reveal that we have been working for a while on case studies. Now, the case study method is a really great way for people to dig into an issue and learn. And so we have been working with our colleagues across the federal government to find ways to showcase the great leadership that's going on across the country in, uh, in various ways by, by federal leaders. So um, today, the site goes live. We're going to give you the address. I will tell you that they're all constructed in a similar way, where our central case is based on something that's going on in the federal government, exemplary leadership in the federal government. We've done some video. We do interviews. Um, and a lot of those uh, cases are drawn from the GreenGov award nominees. So thank you for everyone participating in that project of uh, CEQ. All of the case studies have a toolbox, things that you might need to understand what the objectives are, the executive order, statutory language, various kinds of reports or literature that's relevant. And finally, a lot of mini case studies. It's not just the feds leading the way. There's great innovations that we want to showcase at the uh, um, nonprofit level and in the private sector. So I'm really pleased to tell you that this is um, going to be an effort that's underway now at GW, but we're going to carry it on in years future because uh, we really want to provide open access materials largely focus on federal managers, but available to everybody throughout the world. Um, we want to move the bar on sustainability. Tom. Thank you. So let me talk a bit about what we've got for the Postal Service. Uh, one of the issues we do deal with is waste. And uh, we have a unique set of waste that we deal with. Uh, it happens to be mixed paper. Uh, and to allay any concerns and fears what this might all be made up of, uh, there's a lot of advertising mail that comes through the Postal Service that unfortunately <laughs> has bad addresses on it and just can't be delivered. Uh, and we have to dispose of that. Our mixed paper waste represents roughly 90% of the waste that we deal with. So it's a big issue for us. I, I would also allay some other fears. We work diligently with our mailing customers to make sure they keep their mailing lists as accurate as possible, because actually we do not desire to just throw things away that can't be delivered. So we take on both sides of it. But after you're done with it, uh, we've got this waste that has to be dealt with. Um, and, and we wanted to do it in an efficient way as possible. So like really anyone else involved with the executive orders, and we happen to do executive orders on a voluntary basis, we're a unique federal agency, the Postal Service. And we have metrics, uh, and we have targets, and we periodically review them. I sit down with our staff, and we go through them. And it happened to be that waste was not doing so well. We were trying to get a 50% diversion from landfill to recycle, and we weren't making it. We were in the mid-40s, and it was very uh, stuck at that point. Well, we took a fresh look at it to say, what can we do different, and it was really a breakthrough moment for us. Because the lesson we learned, I think, is something that not only applies to the federal sector, but I really think it could apply to really any private uh, organization as well that would be faced with something similar. We took a fresh look at what we're doing and said, forget the 50% target. We think we can break 90%. And what it came down to was taking a good hard look at what we're doing, how we're doing it, and can we standardize it? Um, my quote here is, is critical. Uh, it makes good business sense to do it in reducing the impact on the environment. If you're not familiar with the Postal Service in its current position, uh, at least financially, I'm sure you're very familiar with the Postal Service, we're having a great deal of problems financially. We are not part of the appropriated funds from Congress. We're self-sustaining financially. We've had some difficulty. And so getting capital funds to do projects are very, very difficult. Uh, this is one that made good business sense, and it allowed us to set up a standardized process to recycle mail instead of taking it to the land, uh, landfill. I mean, think of this. You're, you're paying somebody to pick up trash, and instead of doing that, you're going to compact it, do it the right way, get into recycling contracts, and instead of paying someone, they instead will pay you. We've reduced cost, and we're increasing revenue all at the same time. But I had to go forward to the chief 
financial officer for the Postal Service and get roughly $35 million, which is not easy when you don't have much cash to deal with. But this project had over 100% return on investment, payback periods uh, in literally just a matter of years. Um, so, and a net present value of uh, over $100 million on a $30 million investment. So everything worked. Uh, working with all the people to make it happen, working with our own staff was key. Uh, but to just give you a sense of what this actually looks like, a short video here. Hey, Robin. Hi. So I understand you're actually the one who runs the machine. Yes, I am. Women power, baby. There we go. So the bottom line to that whole story, just to give you a quick sense of what that looks like, we're doing that for the 33,000 post offices around the country, backflowing all of that undeliverable mail to our 250 processing centers who then have a standardized setup of this capital equipment of dumpers and compactors, and then they all have recycling contracts. It's a standardized approach to getting the whole thing done. We had to work with all our functional counterparts to make it happen. And then the story to be told after even the case study, we are to this very day working closely with our counterparts in the maintenance operation. We have about 40,000 employees in our maintenance operation nationwide to get their full support. And that's really, I think, if there's a story behind the story in the case study, is how do you work with, collaborate, and get things done with other functional groups? And that's what we were able to make happen and continue to do. The concept is there, it's working. Now we're going through the process to make sure the changes we've made will actually stick and get it built into the whole maintenance process. Uh, the case study, I think, was a great opportunity for us, really in many ways, to document what we did, get a record of it, uh, tell the story, and, and share it with others so hopefully you can learn from some of the things we did. Um, case studies for us have been very important. We, we, um, we work in an industry that's technology driven. Nobody wants to be first. So for us, it's a very good opportunity to show that the implementation of a technology is, is feasible, how it happened, how it's benefited, et cetera. The one described here is um, we make a, um, a bio-based dielectric fluid. So what's a dielectric fluid? Try to keep this 30 seconds or less. Within, within an electrical transformer, those are those big gray and green boxes that go all the way from generating stations to uh, next to renewable energy to distribution lines that, that keep the lights on. Inside of each of them is a bunch of stuff, but, but, but the main uh, or big medium in there is a fluid. Uh, primarily, it's mineral oil, which is a petroleum-based fluid. We invented 20 plus years ago a bio-based fluid. It's called FR3 fluid. It's produced from soybean oil, so it's 100% bio-based. Um, and it, it, it functions equivalently as compared to mineral oil. Um, however, it has three redeeming qualities over mineral oil. The first is fire safety. It has a, a very high uh, K-class fire point of 360 centigrade, so there's never been a fire in an FR3 filled transformer, so customers use it for that reason. Second one is environmentally. It has the best available um, environmental position out of any fluid, certainly as compared to mineral oil, but it's fully non-toxic, non-hazardous, biodegradable in soil and, and water, um, carbon neutral, um, et cetera. So it's, it's really positioned in the, in the event of a spill or something like that. It poses much less risk to the user. And the third is actually more of a, without getting into too much technology, the way that it works in, as part of the Insulation system inside the transformer is such that it, it has better thermal capabilities. What does that mean? A dielectric fluid has two pro reasons for existing. It's an electrical conductor, or a, a induct conductor and it is, a, it is a coolant. So um, because it can be run warmer, if you can design a transformer that can run warmer, you can design smaller transformers, less materials, conservation of materials, conservation of cost also for that matter. So, 
Um, we participated in, um, in the Kennedy Space Center study um, where, and at, at the current time, 81 of their 345 transformers is filled with our uh, FR3 uh, bio-based dielectric fluid. Um, we've also um, participated, uh, another section of my group, in, um, in a case study that is really meant to, to showcase what is happening in, in industry and what is available in industry. Um, we also make um, a, a line of asphalt-related pro um, products. So I'll ask everybody a question. I'll make it easy on you. How many of you have not driven by road construction this summer? <laughs> um, it's, and we may, amongst our products, we make a product of a rejuvenator. So what, what does that do? It's over time, asphalt dries, cracks, and, and, and at some point has to be replaced. We make a bio-based rejuvenator product. It replaces, there are other softeners on the market that are, again, petroleum-based. Um, it is a rejuvenator that you, basically, you're going to use recycled asphalt, um, some of our rejuvenator product. It will bring that, um, that asphalt properties back up to acceptable levels or the, the, the acceptance standards, and you can essentially recycle all of that used asphalt on site. So if you ever, as you're driving by, we don't make bio-based orange cones, but if, as you see them, them pouring and, and, and basically making up asphalt, that is a, a very effective way of doing it, and again, it's bio-based. Um, and at the end of the, the case studies, um, it, it's in, it hopes to be kind of cradle to grave. There's a Q&A section and kind of a who do you contact um, uh, story. So it, the, the case studies themselves try to be all-encompassing and try to answer all the questions up front. Great. So um, we're really excited about these. Um, Tom presented uh, what was going on with waste in the Postal Service, Dave, on uh, bio-based. We also have three comprehensive case studies that we're not talking about in any depth here this morning. One on power purchase agreements as a strategy for achieving renewable energy goals, supply chain management for greenhouse gas emission reduction, and fleet electrification. And I'll just say one word there. We had a, a GreenGov dialogue on fleet electrification here on campus in July working with CEQ. And a lot of my faculty left that event saying, wow, the feds are doing some really great things. So again, these case studies become live today. At least I hope so. I have a young man who's been doing all of the graphic design. He's a web designer up in New York City. And he works oftentimes between 2 and 4 AM for me. Um, different lifestyle. I'm, I'm old now. Um, but we were um, working up until the last moment. But this is the website. Um, oh, can you, Dave, can you just, oh, it's right there. I see it didn't move on the big, oh, thank you. So it's uh, provost.gwu.edu slash GW case studies. And if you don't get through today, you should be get, getting through tomorrow. It's on your program. It's on the website, that, that address. And we look forward to your feedback on it. So thank you very much.